think it should do a countdown. Yep, there you go. So now we're going to go back over here. And let's go ahead and give this a test click. Yep. Forward takes you forward, back takes you back. Forward, back. Okay. And you are now live, so start whenever you are ready. Okay. So what time is it? Are we are we pretty much on? We're a minute off. Now, do you see me? I'm about to. Okay. I'm um, um, assuming OBS did what it was supposed to. Everyone can see you. I'm about to check whether or not it's working. All right, so we can get started. Right? Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to this edition of the National Digital Inclusion Week, the presentations here at Oak Hill Collaborative. I'm excited to be here. My name is Steve Kristen. I do um, some consulting work here at Oak Hill Collaborative as well as with Eastgate, and I'm a returning presenter. I've spoken to you before, and I'm excited that um, we get to participate here at Oak Hill Collaborative on the good work that the NDIA is doing. Speaking of that, just uh, to get us started here, so this is National Digital Inclusion Week at Oak Hill Collaborative. Nationwide, we're participating with hundreds of other organizations. And I'm excited just to let you know what we do offer this week. And if you had a chance to catch something great, if you want to see it again, uh, we've taped it. Also, if you were able not able to make it, we have it taped. We do live stream these all on Facebook. But so far, we've given a Raspberry Pi and a resume writing workshop. Today we're going to be talking about smart cities and what makes them smart. Uh, we're, we have something come up on Wednesday for robotics and then security. We're, we're anxious to hear what our consultant from Amazon is going to tell us about security and then avatars. I know I've talked to some people that actually this morning could barely spell avatar, let alone tell me what it means. So that's something I encourage them to come out and see. So anyhow, we're going to get started today. And the, uh, the topic is really, why are we here? The bottom line is, why are we here? We're, so we're going to be talking about smart cities and, and what makes a smart city smart. What's the benefits for the, the residents? But before we get into that, what I wanted to kind of step back and say, our purpose in in life here at Oak Hill Collaborative is what we call digital equity inclusion. We believe that everybody needs to have access to the same information regardless of where you live, regardless of what your economic status is, and we strive hard to make that happen. We do that in, in terms of accessibility to internet. If you, if you have uh, some financial needs, we can have that. We can help you with that with the Affordable Connectivity Program. If you have some training issues, um, want to learn more about how to use the equipment, we can do that. Uh, we can also help you acquire some equipment. We have a, a promotion where we offer refurbished PCs at a very reasonable rate. So whatever you need, whether it's affordability, accessibility, equipment, or what have you, be sure and contact Oak Hill Collaborative. We can help you out as we strive to make this Youngstown community and the Pomone Valley more digitally equitable. So with that in mind, the question that comes up this morning is, what makes a smart city smart? <laughs> what makes a smart city smart? So we think about it. If you go back to 19, say 1970, the government was taking pictures of photographs and in analyzing very in a, in a very crude way, but they were starting to capture information and then make some decisions based on that. And that was very successful. And over time, it's expanded, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I go back to 19, early, mid-1990s. I lived in Troy, Michigan. Troy, Michigan at the time had 45,000 people live there and 90,000 people work there. So what does that mean? That means during the day you have a lot of traffic. I lived and worked in Troy and my commute was 45 minutes each way. And I'll tell you, 45 minutes when you're sitting in a car at the end of the day or beginning of the day is a long time. What the city government did though is they installed cameras that took pictures and videoed intersections and then they made decisions based on that. Now, these are all manual decisions, but my commute went from 45 minutes 
down to 12 minutes. And I'll tell you, 12 minutes, the difference between 45 minutes and 12 is dramatic. So that was a first-hand experience that I saw with smart cities. That was a way smart cities could actually benefit me. Uh, now, we look at that, you, when you talk to some of the experts, like the, uh, the United Nations, they tell us that by 2050, that's 2050, which is not that long from here, 2050, 70% of the world's population will be living in a city. So as we think about that, we have to make plans now on how our cities can be more vibrant and how they can be more attractive from economic development and how they can be better sustainability, environmental factors, all of those things, and we'll talk about that. But before we go too far down, people ask me, what is a smart city? What is a smart city? Well, basically, at a very high level, a smart city is a city or municipality that utilizes technology, collects data, analyzes that data, and then makes decisions based on that to best serve and promote their people, their services, their products. And you go back, I mentioned what Troy was doing. When Troy was doing that, that's probably what we would call Generation 1, where the government would collect the data, then they would manually make decisions on it. Generation 2 is they collect the data, and then they have what we call artificial intelligence or data analytics, but the computer then takes the information, massages it, analyzes it, and spits out some recommendations. That's version 2 or addition 2, generation 2. We're moving now into what I refer to as generation 3, and generation 3 is the most exciting piece. So we still have the sensors, we collect the data, we still analyze it, but the difference is, and we'll talk about this in more depth in just a minute, we are actually empowering the residents to help guide us, to tell us the information that they need, that they want. And I'll give you some examples of that. But as, as we look about that, when we say SMART, SMART cities, what we're talking about, that's an acronym for sustainable, for, for modern, it's accountable, it's reliable, and thriving. So with that in mind, you want to say, well, well how does it really work? Well, that's a good question, because it works in all kinds of different ways depending on what the needs of the individual population at that point is for that city. So some cities do do a lot, we'll talk later about that in terms of what they do, maybe with electric. City of Oslo has 650,000 LED lights that they control and they monitor. Um, other cities, like Kansas City, may monitor their trash pickup. You have cities like New York that focus a lot on the crime. And so it's all over the board. You can't say that one smart city does everything like this or another city does everything like that. It really depends, especially when we focus on Generation 3. What do the citizens need and what do they want? So why do we do that? Why do we do that? Well, first of all, we are, we are running out of natural resources oftentimes. So we have to be more efficient on our use of natural resources. We have to be more effective on how we deploy those. For instance, water. Water is an example. We're fortunate here in Northeast Ohio, we have access to water, plenty of access to water. But not every city around the country is like that. So we have to make sure we, we value that and we, we utilize it in a way that's sustainable. Thinking about that, it, you know, one of the things that we saw a lot of times with water leaks, to give you a prime example of, of how smart cities can help with water leaks, typically the way you'd find a water leak is you would be driving down the road and you would see a puddle on the street or a puddle in the yard. Well, a smart city concept is what if we had sensors on those water pipes throughout the city that would be tracking when, when there's a leak detection? So if they can detect the leak, we can actually have people deployed to that before the leak gets out of hand. So that's just that's one thing. But I think the big key is we want to provide better services, more effective services for the residents, and you do that through smart cities. So. When you, when you understand what's going on in, in the world with 70% of people will live in cities by 2050, it really becomes something like we've got to address it. The earlier you address it, really the, the better you are. So how does this, a smart city work? When we talk at a very high level, so you have technology that you then use connect to sensors. And when I say sensors, we'll talk a little bit about those in a moment. There's all kinds of sensors. If you look at um, the industry, there's probably over a thousand new sensors being brought to market every day. So there's a lot of sensors out there. That, that sensor then collects data. The data is then transmitted typically through technology. It could be wireless, it could be other ways, but it's transmitted, then it's analyzed, and then problems are solved. So the idea is how can we collect the data, how can we address a problem, and then solve it. 
what I like to use uh, another acronym so you'll find that I'm big on acronyms the acronym that I like is the CACA so what is that C A C A collection analysis communications and action so what do we do we collect the data we then analyze it we communicate and then we take action so as we go into the how does it work when you look at smart city there's there's a wide variety of components and I, I like to break them down this way because it's easier for for people to kind of grasp it if you're looking at a more community level so when we say smart cities we can also use the concept of a smart community or even a smart home and I can talk about my air tags that I use to track my dog and my lost luggage and, and everything at home but it conceptually works the same so when you look at the components you have smart transportation transportation may, may mean how do I track my parking lot availability nothing's more frustrating driving through a downtown area trying to parking a parking spot and driving around and around and around so if I have the technology in place that can tell me hey Steve or hey Anita hey Vicki I have a spot for you it's down this way make a left that makes my life a lot easier so traffic management with parking is great even the traffic flow can be great uh, as I as I said earlier with my Troy Michigan example that saved my drive time my commute from 45 minutes reduced it to 12 so that's one area we talk about, about traffic and transportation you have energy I mentioned you Oslo 650,000 LED lights and they're, they're controlling that so when you talk about energy costs going up how can we be more efficient and more effective with energy costs whether it's gas electric water whatever it might be so they're what we call smart energy there's also smart homes we talk a lot about that a lot of people that are listening to this probably have the ring doorbell on their their front door um, video cam may be checking on their their elderly parents there's a lot of communications that take place within the home same concept we have sensors we collect the data we analyze it and then we take action one thing where the cities can really uh, really benefit in terms of a smart infrastructure as we start working on our infrastructure whether roads bridges whatever it might be we can take into account the technology so when we're looking at say putting in roads and excavate excavation of roads we want to put in conduit see so Youngstown is doing that now with their smart two project let's put in a conduit ahead of time so we can prepare for the fiber that needs to be there you have smart services smart city services uh, one city as I mentioned Kansas City they they track their their garbage pickup based on the electronic sensors so they don't go out there every day to pick up the trash only when it's needed but when it is needed they know about it, they can they can take action then you have smart health I, I know a lot of people listening today probably have on an Apple watch and and they'd be monitoring their heartbeat their EKG those kind of things so a lot of communications takes place in what we call smart health and then you also have what we call smart arch smart agriculture I would be remiss if I wouldn't talk about what farmers are doing now the sophistication of these new tractors is, is really unbelievable um, the GPS tracking that they do so it's these are an idea of some areas for smart cities um, I came across this morning to give you an example one of the one of the things that was out of the box thinking but it really gets me excited when you think of what the potential is in our community on where the community needs are but nationwide there are about 26,000 accidents that take place over billions of dollars of damage between deer and cars and I know myself the other day I was coming home and I almost hit a deer I think I think it ended up being two feet away from but the point being there's a problem so Wyoming saw the problem their citizens said hey we got we got a problem so what they did through using smart technology they actually put now tracking devices and sensors on the deer and they tracked the migration pattern I didn't know this until I read the study, but deers out in Wyoming, they, they migrate about 150 miles. So what you can do is if you can track the patterns, you've got, you've got growth, you've got construction. If we can see patterns of deer, we know that these are deer crossings, not because so many deer have been hit. We don't have to wait for accidents to happen, but we can track with, with, with the intelligent device that's in the deer in the collar. Now, it's not necessarily, uh, it doesn't come free. There's some cost involved, but there's different ways that you can minimize that cost and the the recent IIJ infrastructure bill from the federal government has money in there to help with this sort of problem. So anyhow, that's just a couple components. When you look at sensors, I know this might be a little bit hard to read, but I wanted you to, to kind of sense that there's all sorts of sensors. So 
you look here, you may have sensors that are for motion. If, and your phone does that. If, if you have your phone and, and you're in the car, it senses that you're moving. So there's sensors for motion, there's sensors for stationary, there's sensors for elevation, there's sensors for sound. Um, you know, there are video cameras that come on when they detect motion, somebody's moving. There are microphones that come on when they hear a sound. Whether it's a noise, a shot, whatever it might be, they can come on, turn themselves on. And they're getting more and more sophisticated. So it's, it's interesting to see, again, what we're trying to drive to is what does the community need? What do they need to monitor and how we can, can best help that? From a from a strictly an IT standpoint, and, and I say that because we've got some IT people and we are an IT organization to some extent, but there's different layers, if you will, and I say this because it's, it's interesting to point out how we build upon the concept of a smart city. So we have, we have the components and the sensors and then, and then what I call the layer. So we have the network at the bottom. So you, what you have to do is have a connection. You have to have an internet. If you don't have a strong internet connection in your community, you can't do smart cities. We then have, that's a sensor layer, there's a network layer, then you have, what do you do with that data? And we'll talk about some of the challenges in a minute. Uh, we know about the transportation benefits and so forth, but what are the challenges? Well, we've got to collect that data, and the collection can be, can be good or bad, it's really neutral, but how we use the data is what determines if it's positive or negative. There's application layers and business layers, and these are kind of a technical, I don't want to get too much into weeds, if you have further questions I can take those. Um, afterwards, but the point being is this is a very sophisticated network that is presented in a way that that people can understand it and benefit from it. So let me talk a little bit more about the advantages of a smart city. A lot of people look at smart cities and automatically go to the idea of safety and and I would be remiss if I would not say that is a prime reason to have smart cities. You can monitor with video cameras, you can look at intersections, so safety is a big thing whether it's uh, for shooting detection, whether it's body cameras, just video cameras at your front door, you know who's come to your front porch, those kind of things, and same thing with emergency services. So safety is obviously a big piece of it. Transportation management, we've talked about that. How can I move people through in and out of my city in a way that's, that's less disruptive for them, that I'd have less car crashes, I'd have less display, uh, less disruptions. Last thing you want to do is have to leave an extra hour early to find a parking spot. If I know I have smart parking, I don't have to do that. The other thing is we can also look at a more efficient use of services. I, if I can reduce some of my waste in public government, I can help, I can save money, make myself and my services more effective, whether it's water, electricity, whatever it might be. The other thing what we see is when you look at, when you look at the concept, if I have a more smart city that tends to attract workers and economic development. Workers and economic development means I have growth in my city and that's important to do. So as I improve my infrastructure, as I improve my technology infrastructure, I have more workers that come in that people want to live, they relocate here to my area. And so the idea here is all good and said, said and done. But what we're driving for, as I said earlier, we want to make sure that we're hitting the concept of digital equity. I want to make sure that what I'm doing is equitable in the sense that I'm, re I'm reaching all my constituents throughout the city. I'm not hitting certain pockets, certain geographic areas. So that's where, as I mentioned earlier, this whole concept of the third generation of smart cities, I have the, the citizenry is now getting empowered. We're teaching them how technology works. We, we give them the idea of what if, what if we did this, what if we did that, and we build them up, and then they help empower the city to bring these services to, to fruit, to bear. Now, that said, I would also be remiss if I wouldn't tell you about some of the disadvantages, or let's say challenges you might have. And, you know, you can say disadvantage, you can say challenges, but they are real. A couple things to, to consider is as we're tracking more, the sensors are out there, they're tracking more and more. For instance, your phone does that today. If you're having a conversation with a friend over, let's say, pickup trucks or, or let's say tennis shoes, there's a good chance that your phone is picking that up and next thing you know, you're seeing an ad for tennis shoes or an ad for pickup trucks. That My wife and I have done that over and over again. We used to scratch our heads and say, why is that going on? Now we know. 
they're tracking that. So tracking something that takes place very often, but from a privacy standpoint, for the sensors to track that, I have to give up some privacy. So that's an issue. How do we manage that? Well, one is that we can be more, more selective on what we do with the data we collect. The other thing, we can be more secure in having it. It's not stored in a sense that anybody has access to it. There's, there's security that can be put in place. So the government does get more information and more access to information, so that is con considered a, a, a privacy issue by some people. There's also a higher reliance on the, the broadband infrastructure and the internet that you have. If I'm storing my data on the cloud, I need a strong connection to collect the data, to then upload it, and then to analyze it. So I need a strong internet connection to do that. Now interestingly, Wyoming doesn't have a strong internet connection in the whole state. So in some areas they have GPS, so they're using satellite to track the deer, and they're, and they're marking them and mapping where they go. In cases where the deer are areas that really don't have a good GPS connection, they actually use a device similar, a little bit cheaper, but it's a collar that tracks their movement and then stores it locally on, on the collar itself. And when the deer get to a different spot, there's a signal that goes off and then that information from the deer is then transferred to the scientists so they can map that out. So, and that was something, that, to me, that's a great example of how the community can empower the government to help. The other thing that we have to keep in mind that for this to work, we have, a, we, have a, we have to empower our citizens to be more technically literate, but we also have to help our government employees because they're on the front lines with this technology. So we want to make sure that we're not only training our citizens, but we're also training and upgrading the skills of our employees so they can help with this whole data collection of data analytics. So anyhow, lots of, lots of advantages, some disadvantages. When you look at the challenges, so I looked at, I kind of grouped this this way, and I, let me say that some of this information came from a study that was, a paper that was written by University of Louisville, excellent study. If you send me the, uh, I can send you a link to it if you, if you ask, but it's a great study, it goes through some of these. And so you look at the components of security and privacy. You know, if all my data is stored in the cloud, I have to make sure it's secured. And so that does require a city to have maybe a higher level of security for data. Um, the same thing with, with my sensors. I want to be sure that I'm tracking the right information, not over-tracking, not under-tracking. And then the whole idea of a network. I need to move my data around. I need a strong network. I can't get by with uh, like the old-fashioned dial-up. I need a strong, typically a fiber connection to draw that. So those, so those are some, some things that I need. Now, what's interesting is when, you, when I tried to put together some examples, um, I, there was a challenge because there are so many examples out there that it was hard to find some consistency. So let me give you a couple examples just to, to give you some thoughts. So a city up north of us, right along Lake Erie, they were having challenges with the pollution and the chemicals that were in the water at the beach area. Typically what they would do is they'd go to the beach every so often, they would test it, and then they would make a decision, maybe it's not safe for people to, to swim. What they, what they did from a smart city perspective is they put sensors on buoys and had those about 100 yards offshore, and they were tracking the chemicals and as soon as they reached a, a level that they want to shut the beach down, they could then notify the people that the water is not yet contaminated, but it's getting there, and they could shut the beach down. So rather than wait till the contamination is there, they were proactive and said, okay, we're going we're gonna to test this. We know eventually it'll happen, and then we can notify the, the citizens. Now, for some citizens that had a smartphone or had internet connection, they were notified immediately. But again, this is where the digital equity piece comes in. If you don't have access to the internet, you don't have access to that information. So you may have two people that, that are, are very similar in what they want to do. They want to swim on a beach, yet one has access to information and knows when it's safe and knows when it's not. The other doesn't have that. Uh, and I, I mentioned some other cities. You know, there's 3,200 sensors in San Diego. California traffic is, is horatious, and for those of you who've been there. But San Diego sees that as a potential opportunity, so they have 3,200 sensors throughout their downtown area to minimize their disruption, to maximize the parking efficiency and effectiveness. One of the areas that I haven't been to yet that I like to go and study is Barcelona. Very pretty country out there, people tell me. They actually have a smart bus system 
where they not only include Wi-Fi on their buses, but they also include free charging stations on the buses. Reason for that is because you want to encourage people to have that smartphone, to use that technology. What better way to do that is to have charging stations available. So the buses themselves actually have charging stations on them. And then we, we've seen a lot of examples of the street lights, whether it's in Youngstown, maybe doing some street lights moving to LED. Um, the cities that I think of, I think of Kansas City, where they have where they actually have smart street lights. The street lights are saving money, uh, saving electricity in terms of LED. You can you can vary when they come in and then go off. I know behind me, I have a school behind me, and they set the dial and the lights to go on and off. They don't have a sensor. It's not based on the light of day. It's based on the time of day. So as time as as it gets darker sooner or darker later, the lights are out of whack. So in many cases, they have the light to turn the lights on too soon, wasting electricity. Other times, they're turning the lights on too late and not taking advantage of the safety with lights. So again, that's where smart smart sensors pretty easy to do, and and you can you can kind of save some money there. And finally, I think of um, Singapore. So Singapore, if you've ever been there, I have not I've seen pictures. I know people have been there. It's a very clean, clean country, and they actually have sensors to monitor the cleanliness of their public spaces. They monitor their energy use. They monitor their water use. But they've said, their citizens have said, you know what, this is important for us. We want to have a clean city. So then the government has set up the sensors to monitor that and then to analyze it. And they can also then analyze things like how often does that that public space need to be cleaned? Is that something maybe it, if they can put it on a rotation every week, once a day, three every three hours, whatever it might be. So those are just a few examples. There's a ton of potential. Um, as you can see, the whole definition of smart city is evolving. There is no one definite definition that fits all. Um, but so what's the next step? So, you know, you're looking at this. Um, We've got people saying, yes, I'm interested. What do I need to do? How do I take this forward? Well, first of all, what, what I would encourage citizens to do is get involved, understand technology. If you, if you don't understand technology, reach out to organizations such as Oak Hill. Take, take some classes, talk to people, get on the Internet. If you, if you can't do that now because you can't afford it, especially talk to Oak Hill Collabor. They can sign you up on the ACP, Affordable Connectivity Program where you get low cost, in many cases, free internet. Um, if you need some hardware, you, and that's a computer, we can get you a laptop at a very reasonable price. We can get you trained, we get you signed up. And then start getting involved, finding out what are the options to do. What kind of sensors, what's important to your city? Maybe you have a park down the street and you'd like to put video cameras on just to make it a little more safe. That's That would be considered a smart city application. And so things like that, Rather than having the city at a high level look over things, what we want to see is, is I would say, from a third generation where the, the citizens are empowered and, and they say, this is what we need. This will make our city better. So first of all, you want to get, you want to get the people involved. Second of all, I would say, let's encourage our elected officials to learn more about this technology. To, to get some experience and find out what's going on around the world. What's, what's interesting about this when you look at smart cities, there's a lot of ideas taking place all over the world. So in many cases, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. What you want to do is find out from the citizens what you can do, what they want, and then find out who's doing it, go out there, watch them. For instance, I know the city of Atlanta is doing something that uh, would be very interesting, interesting to, to talk to a lot of people, and I mentioned this from a smart home perspective, and we'll touch on that in a minute, a lot of people have ring doorbells, right, where they have the video camera. Think about it. So in a neighborhood, you may have 10 or 12 homes, and you may have, let's say you have 10, 10 or 12 uh, ring doorbells there tracking that. What if you had the capability of not only tracking that, somehow collecting it and having it in one spot so people that need it, maybe for safety, uh, maybe uh, EMT response, something like that, they would have access to that information. Now, granted, we have to have privacy rules in place and everything else, but imagine if we had all the people that are collecting the data now, individually, come together and do some kind of joint safety program. Um, I mean, there's a lot of potential here and there. So we want to help the government. We want to help with the training 
to, to have the have the employees of the government in the cities municipalities tell us where can we help can we help get funding for that training can we help them in terms of how this stuff works and 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 start small typically you start small with a pilot i think city of atlanta that's a great idea where you combine all the video camera the feeds uh, but realistically that doesn't happen overnight so maybe we start at a neighborhood maybe we start with with a city uh, a simply a city park that wants to put some video cameras and monitor that uh, we can monitor for microphones for for gunshots or whatever it might be again it all depends on what the cities want so again wrapping this up smart cities use technology with sensors and then they take that that data that they collect they analyze it and they make predictions and, and they offer services and improve resources for the citizens of the area so again when you look at citizen when you look at smart again i'm talking about sustainable i talk about modern i talk about accountable reliable and then i talk about thriving so i'm not sure where my time is on that i've gone through um again i'm a returning presenter for for oak hill here at the ndia the the uh, national digital inclusion week so we're excited to be here and, and thank you for for listening and it's uh, it's a wonderful resource if you have not stopped out yet at oak hill collaborative go online join us um we're expanding we're doing uh, a lot of good things here in our neighborhood we'd love to have you participate in some of our training and all the training that we offer in classes and presentations are free so with that anthony are we are we done you actually did so well i still gotta wait on pizza oh okay <laughs> i did order some though so oh did you good so uh, let me know when that's off and then i can talk about anita there we go <laughs> so i am so glad thank you